Yeah, because it's 45 minutes short. First week, then a lot. The second week was 30 minutes. Wait, did they play both weekends? Oh, I thought they only played. I wonder. They probably didn't have shows in between, right? They didn't like leave and they come back. Probably, yeah. I mean, I don't think they've had a state before in a long time, so. But clearly they're out of practice. Super. They're complaining that about the, uh, the technicals, but the cameras. They're like, bro, they had pink flying on, on cables. I think they got pink was amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. It was totally not. It was good. Thanks. I kind of sucked, but hey, you know what? It was free. Yeah. No one's going to let if you need me to get one, you just let me know. <laughs> okay, well, we have all our, all our speakers here. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our next AMA Power Hour. Um, we've now, as, as this team, this is our second one that we're having, and we're delighted to see that every time we're getting better, there's, there's uh, uh, more people attending, and we have had an absolutely amazing time over the last month, two, month, two months, putting this one together. And I'm sure all of you agree that the um, kind of the marketing that was done up, leading up to this event was really amazing. So I'm really, really pleased with what, what's been achieved. I'd like to introduce our speakers. Um, I'm going to start out with uh, Sarah Proof. She's the founder of Skip Collective. Um, Sarah is a PR veteran and founder of Skip Collective, uh, leveraging media context in, to directing crisis communication strategies. Sarah is a marketing and communicate. Uh, uh, sorry, Sarah is a marketing communication uh, veteran with more than enough experience overseeing terror from a public relations standpoint. She has managed PR and marketing campaigns for small, medium, large fashion, beauty, food, and beverage CPGs, restaurants, hotels, and more. In 2022, Sarah launched Skip, a collective focused on growth marketing, branding, creative, and management. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. <laughs> and then I'd like to introduce Maggie. Um, Maggie Glenn is the vice president at Mac One Group. Maggie is a communications expert with storytelling experience across the entire state. Listen to this. Bef prior to joining Mac One Group, she served as a capital correspondent for 14 broadcast stations across Texas, turning content daily on the legislature along with biggest breaking news stories in the state. Maggie was at the forefront of the, of the coverage of the state's response to COVID-19 and the winter storm URI. I hope I'm pronouncing that URI, correct. same thing. URI, okay. While also landing exclusive interviews ahead of the 2022 primaries, on both sides of the aisle. Maggie is now share, sharing that behind the camera experience with clients as they garner media attention at, as her role with Mac One Group. Welcome, Maggie. <laughs> and then Russ Summers, Chief Marketing Officer at Litho. Russ leads marketing with Litho, the creative operations platform for major brands. After many years as a musician and a bartender, Russ moved into marketing, first, to pro first in product marketing for large companies such as Dow and Dun and Brand Brad Street, and then building the marketing teams that led to successful e exits for startups like Trendkite and Invoda. He has a BA and an MBA from the University of Texas, Austin. Uh, Russ writes and records music in his spare time, collects, restores oddball and vintage guitars. I'd love to talk to you about that later. <laughs> and is in the process of helping his teenage, ki teenage kids launch into the world. Well, I can talk a little bit more about that later too. <laughs> and then I'd like to uh, welcome Russ. And then I'd like to welcome Jane Messer. Um, uh, Bert uh, was is your your better half? He's actually a ghost. No, I'm kidding. He's not <laughs> <laughs> no, he's you could get away with that here tonight. <laughs> I'm a stick with the no. <laughs> Jane Messer um, is the founder of Unearthly History and Paranormal Investigations. 
Jane Messer, um, Bert and Jane both grew up in haunted houses and have held lifelong beliefs in the paranormal. Jane has been driving vintage hearses around downtown Austin as a tour guide for Haunted ATX and since 19, 2018. After years of being a musician, Bert has a found a love for all things tech in the paranormal field and in 2019, they began recording their research and sharing their discoveries on their YouTube channel, Unearthly History of the Paranormal Investigations. <laughs> Welcome, Jane. And, and then uh, tonight, ladies and gentlemen, obviously we'd like to thank Capital Factory for hosting us. Uh, we'd like to thank Bento Picnic for the food. Excellent. And we would like to thank our volunteer bartender, Mr. Travis Summers. But alas, Travis is not just our bartender, he is also the VP of Communications, and he uh, was behind some of those really nice creative stuff that came out, reminding all of us about this evening. Now, let's quickly just have a show of hands. Whom of you are here to network? Okay, keep those hands up. Whom of you are here to learn? Can use your other hand. All right. That means the rest of you are here to drink and eat, and that's also good. <laughs> Great. My name is Francois. Uh, most of you have met me already. Um, by day, I do some work for the BBB. I help them with their revenue sales and new business development and modernizing all their marketing fun funnels. By night, I'm the president of the Austin Chamber uh, AMA. Um, I also have a few side hustles um, in the process uh, of building up three startups uh, in the EV conversion uh, kind of industry, uh, pet industry, and in the insurance industry. So to say that I'm being kept busy is an understatement. We know that in marketing, nothing ever goes according to plan. And when things go wrong, that's when the best marketing professionals shine. Uh, they navigate this uncomfortable, these uncomfortable waters when there's this terror or scary story. But how we respond to a difficult situation will often determine the brand's reputation more than at the actual disaster itself. Now, when I read that, and I have to credit Marissa for putting that together, I thought that that was one of the best lines I've ever heard about marketing professionals. But very few times do, mar do people come to you and say to you, fantastic, things are just working, the campaigns are going out, that's all great. But then when the shit hits the fan, that's when we really, really shine. So I'll tell, start out by telling you my first story, which happened about 20 odd years ago. It, um, I had, we had signed up a, um, a uh, celebrity as one of our spokespeople. And about a year into this relationship, he was appearing on all of our advertisements. He was on advertisements, advertisements both on TV, on newspaper, in magazines, and became very well recognized as the brand ambassador for our business. On one particular Monday morning, my marketing uh, head came to me with the newspaper, put the newspaper down, and, and on the newspaper, on the advertisement, was a picture of him advertising our competitor brand. Uh, very shortly afterwards, our national distributors started phoning and started querying what was going on. There was no news release that he had changed or that we have somebody new. Uh, and uh, as you all know, when something like this happens, the company or the, the head of marketing gets the blame, never, the, never the, the spokesperson, never the actor, never the celebrity, we get the blame. So you can imagine that there was a fair amount of damage control that we had to do that particular Monday morning call. Uh, the, the kind of the first step was, was to design scripts that we can give out to all our staff so that if they do get any incoming calls that they know what to say. And then came the difficult journey of having to talk to the agent and the celebrity themselves. Um, and there were many reasons that they gave that they thought that they read the contract a different way. But at the end of the day, the preventative measure of making sure that you have the right people looking at your contracts, but more so that you go and you make sure that you communicate well with your celebrity spokesperson on a regular basis so that you can educate them about what to do right and what to do, what, what, what are the do's and what are the don'ts, that's critical. Because let me tell you something, they don't read the contract. So it's that relationship that's probably the, the key. And that segues beautifully um, into the next story. Uh, and I'm now gonna hand over to Sarah who's going to tell us about her experience. Yeah, so I um, have a, very relatable experience. Um, 
throughout my career, I have had a lot of clients who have worked with celebrities as their spokesperson. Uh, I started in New York City in fashion and beauty, and so I, I had, like I said, just a lot of experience, you know, working with people who, at that caliber, um, you know, educating them on talking points, and, you know, just kind of treading that line of, like, how much do you man micromanage them, and how much do you just kind of back off and let them do what they do best? Um, and so when I moved to Austin, I actually transitioned into um, more of like the food and beverage space. And, you know, it had been a little bit since I had worked directly with a celebrity. Um, however, you know, I've worked a lot with media in that realm. Um, so we were launching a particular campaign for a client of mine, and we happened to be as long with that uh, announcement, we were pitching, because uh, I worked in PR, pitches are our main source of anything that will ever come out of PR. Um, and we were pitching uh, interviews with this celebrity person to you know, speak on, half, on behalf of the partnership with my client. Um, and at the time, they were launching a new season of the show that he was involved in. Um, and, you know, this was about two years ago, and so, you know, we're, we're in this time of very, very sensitive conversations happening all the time around diversity and privilege and a lot of different things, and so it's, it's also a very sensitive subject to come up during interviews. Um, and so my primary job for this process was to, the interview was secured, great, Point one, um, that's you know a big objective for our firm. The next point was to you know hand over the call sheet for the interview to the person who's taking the interview. Um, since you know we are the PR team for the client and the brand that is partnering with this celebrity person, you know I was I was pretty hands off in the process. You know every everything inside me as a publicist was saying, Sarah, you gotta make sure that, you know, he's on top of the talking points, you gotta meet with his publicist, but this particular person spends a lot of time on TV. And he talks, he spoke a lot with media throughout his career. So it was kind of an assumption that was like, you know, he's a pro at this. It's, he understands all of the, the storylines coming around, you know, this particular show and what's coming out and, um, so we get into this virtual interview, and um, it kind of, the, the inter person interviewing was asking questions about recent events and um, asking questions about you know, <coughs> things we had not agreed upon. Um, and the celebrity spokesperson was uh, answering these questions in a way that I would not have advised if he were my direct client. Um, and so it kind of got, uh, it just kind of blew up from there and things spiraled and what came down to it was you know I just had to remember who my client is in this scenario and it is my job to make sure that they come out of this in the best possible light or position and so you know immediately it was the interview happened and it was airing the next morning so I turned back to my team and to the client, informed them of everything that was happening, and right from there we launched a crisis plan just to make sure that you know this client of mine was not going to A, be tied to this person as they were being drawn through the ringer uh, for their comments, and, and also if we do get questions from media who happen to dive deep into you know, the various partnerships that this celebrity person had, then, you know, how do we respond to that? So, you know, we have reactive responses on hand. Um, you know, every media inquiry that came to the client was directly brought to my agency that I was working for at the time, and we just kind of handled it on a case-by-case -case basis. But really, it was such a unique scenario and such a learning experience for me because something like you said is that, you know, it's important to educate your client on make sure that you're reading these contracts thoroughly and reviewing everything. Um, you know, I relate to that because if I take a look back at that experience, you know, yes, this celebrity person was not technically my client, but I was the publicist in the green room at that time. I was the one arranging the interview. And I just have learned that you never assume. You always have to 
especially as like a marketer, a publicist, you know, I consider myself a very type A person and I'm like, oh, Sarah, you know, how you know this, you know, you gotta make sure that that person is media trained, they're totally up to speed on current events, that they have in mind the talking points that they need to get forward and to focus on. And um, I will say though, you know, I did a lot of uh, background work even while the interview was, taught, was happening is like, you know, you kind of have to jump in very quickly into action, you know, even if the interview is taking place and you have the foresight to anticipate how this is going to end and what's going to happen from it, like you start now. Um, you know, so while that was happening, I was even texting the producer saying, you know, when are they going to mention this partnership? You know, I, I think that we should just pull it or, you know, can they save it till the end? And, and luckily, you know, in uh, just the universe worked out in our favor and they left the mention of the launch to the very end of the interview and it got cut. And so it was like, thank you, Lord. <laughs> uh, and uh, and so yeah, it it ended up working out, and, and all was okay. But certainly, like it's just a, a big learning lesson for me as a as a publicist, kind of to take with me. And obviously, terrifying and horrifying as I'm in this virtual green room, and I can't say stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Good one. That's a that's a great story and one to remember. Um, that kind of takes me to my next story, which is more of a marketing event story, um, where we had uh, probably about twice, three times a year, we brought all our top distributors. In those years, um, these were these were guys probably getting close to dollar millionaire kind of range, really influential in their communities, um, very top just uh, insurance distributors, and we would bring them together as you know, kind of spoil factor, uh, strategy sessions, etc. And um, we asked them prior to the, the gathering, you know, what, what would they like to do? And somebody said, well, we'd love to go to a really nice jazz club. And we thought, well, that's really great. And we sent the inspection team over to uh, local jazz clubs, found the right, found one that was quite nice. And the inspection team at the next meeting came back and said, it's fantastic. It's really great. Great artists. We, 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 we need to book it. On the evening, we bust all of these people in, we get to the jazz club, and as I'm walking in, I see a sign and it says, and it's a Wednesday night, and it says, Wednesday night, comedy night. <laughs> and I go, the whole, this can't be true. And I walk down, and it's comedy night, not jazz night. And a big contingent of this group were very religious. About 80% of them were very, very religious. And we, Obviously, we're quite, um, we planned for that. We planned all our events. Well, needless to say, within the first five minutes of sitting down, my head was physically in my hand because the, the first comedian told the most vile, most horrible joke out that would be the most insensitive thing to say to people that are, have, uh, are very um, religious. So the evening got, went from bad to worse and that the, the drive home in the bus was dead silent. Nobody spoke. So you can imagine you know, what, how they were feeling. Relationships were obviously you know, damaged. And the next morning I had to issue an apology and then get the events team together and go, guys, who, like, how could you guys? And they got the night wrong. They, they went to jazz evening on the Thursday night and Wednesday night is the comedy evening. So a small little mistake big consequences and that's a great segue to us which before we go to that I'm curious do you remember the joke because I think most of us are curious. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's not go there I'm kidding. But, yeah. afterwards we laughed a lot about it. I mean, we, we were, when we saw their faces and we, we kind of saw what was going on it was it was you know terrible in the evening we hardly could eat our supper but afterwards about a month later we were laughing about it. So there's that time, right, that looks funny, and Victoria and I were just talking about that because she and I both worked in startups. And in startups, a lot of funny things happen, but a lot of times it takes several years before you can really laugh about them, right? And that's just the nature of the beast because it's a weird kind of work. We were, at the time, and this was where I did work with Victoria, it was a startup called Tremkite that served the PR industry. We were ultimately acquired by Cision. It was a PR analytics product. 
So of course for us, PRSA, Public Relations Society of America, their events were absolutely key to us from a demand gen and branding perspective, right? And we, we always did their events, we always put on a good show. One of the best for us typically was the travel and tourism segment because they break into different segments and this particular year that I'm thinking of the travel and tourism conference was in New Orleans so the team was excited to go and I had a couple three great marketers go into it for me I didn't get to go that time around they rarely let me out of my cage but anyway we, we had everything planned for the show the booth ordered the swag ordered all of the stuff I mean as as the folks that put on this event know, putting on any sort of event is a little exercise in logistics, isn't it, right? There's so much that goes into it. But we had our plan and we were ready to go. And then it was maybe three o'clock the day of the show and my, my phone rang, it was Lacey, and I'm like, what's going on? She goes, the booth is lost. I'm like, no, it's not. You need to go to UPS and figure out how to, she's like, no, 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 we've been on the phone with them most of the day, the booth is lost. They don't know where it is. I don't know if you have the slide, but if you do, it'd be cool to show. Oh, oh no! So anyway, <laughs> the booth disappeared, and we could not find it. And I'm like, well, we have to figure this out. And the team, I had such a great team. They took charge, and they went to Walgreens and bought poster board and markers and made a booth themed around the idea don't you hate it when your luggage gets lost? Which was just them venting, right? It's like, oh my gosh, we can't believe our stuff is lost and trying to put a positive spin on it. But what was hysterical is everybody at the show was like, oh, and even for swag, we uh, they didn't have any swag, so they got like little splits of champagne and Pedialyte, and I don't know why the Pedialyte was supposed to be hangover proof, I don't know. But um, they were handing that out. And the funny thing is, so many people were like, this is such a great viral marketing stunt. You guys are geniuses. How did you come up with this? And they're like, no, it was 10 o'clock and there was a CBS open and this was the best we could do. But to this day, many of the people that we spoke with at that show still think it was a planned thing to take advantage of the fact that it was the travel and tourism segment. So there is always, there's always a win to pull out. There's always something you can do if you keep a sense of humor and find a Walgreens that sells you poster board. <laughs> And vodka, yeah, you can't, <laughs> can't go wrong with that. And that's brilliant. Now, now to tell us how to deal with some of these things, especially when you are confronted by a journalist, I'm going to hand over to Maggie. <laughs> yes, so hello everyone. I actually just joined the PR world a month ago, so I'm still very new to the PR side of things. Um, but I just kind of wanted to go over a few things that would go through my head as a reporter and just kind of different reactions that I would encounter, especially because I covered politics, so there was always one side against the other, right? Um, so something that I think a lot of people know immediately when it comes to handling a crisis or responding to the biggest headline of the day is they have their side down. They know their talking points. They know, you know, what's going to benefit them, what message they need to put across, you know, to everyone. Um, and that's kind of the easy part of it. The thing that I get, I wouldn't say less successful, but um, politicians that are really good at their jobs will know exactly what then the opposition is going to say in you know, kind of response to what they're saying and have a solid answer there too. Because so many times, especially when you're dealing with the kind of more freshman lawmakers, they'll have their, you know, say they're a Republican, they'll have their Republican talking points down no matter what the bill is. But then the second you ask them about maybe Democratic opposition or pushback that they're getting on the other side, if they have a super just kind of basic answer that really doesn't give the journalist anything to go off of, the journalist then has no real ambition to include that kind of half answer in their report. Instead, that kind of fuels the fire of the other side because the other side is able to come back stronger then and have real kind of points to make. It, it just kind of weakens um, whoever's side it is. I don't want to get political, but whoever's side it is, side of the fight. Um, and obviously, when you're dealing with a crisis, you know you're dealing with a crisis and it's kind of all hands on deck. Um, and media training, you know, I'm sure everyone is used to media training and making sure you're ready for these tougher questions. Um, but also, I just want everyone to know too, like taking the national media out of it, your local reporters are on your side. Like, they are going into work every day, they just want to tell the facts, so it's not like you're having to fight the media. I just wanted to say that because it gets talked about all the time. Um, but then also, I wanted to bring up the fact that you should be sure to be media training your clients even when it's not a crisis, 
Um, because one of my favorite examples of this is a Republican congressman who is actually running for attorney general here in Texas, which I'm not going to say the name, but that kind of gives it away. If <laughs> Anyways, um, we were doing in-studio interviews with each of the Republican candidates, and we were very clear that the entire interview was going to be clipped and put on our website unedited. So they needed to be careful with what they were saying. Um, and with this representative, I had asked a, what I would consider a basic follow-up question because I was following what he was saying. And his response before he answered was, well, Maggie, I guess you're more than just a pretty face. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh um, my goodness. And so then that clip went viral. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody watched his full interview because everyone was just focused on that small little comment. They didn't listen to it. The, the interview was 30 minutes long. And everybody was just focused on that five second little clip. So be sure that even if you might think, and this kind of relates to your story too earlier when you were saying yeah. you maybe wanted to talk with them a little bit before the interview, it never hurts to just go over, hey, let's be super vigilant with what we're saying because we never know what clip of this the general public is going to yeah. go crazy with. So, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, uh, it's, it's incredible. And um, just to try to get everybody to think on their feet, mm -hmm. you know. And it's nerve-wracking. It's actually it is. And I've uh, it's a huge skill to it's, get. Yeah. yeah. It's like when you get asked questions, and I had a an interview with a reporter, but it was it was staged, it was rehearsed, and mm -hmm. man, I was dying on stage. Mm -hmm. I couldn't handle that, <laughs> and that was rehearsed, and we had to take three or four cuts, and the camera was on me. So I'd hate to think what it's like when you have to face a cold. You know, mm -hmm. so. Media training is, is critical. And my other note too, really quick, is just that the, especially when you're working with local reporters, they're willing to work with you. Yeah. Like if your client isn't comfortable with doing a live interview, that's fine. You can ask to do pre-recorded. Yeah. And the, the benefit is, unless we tell you that your whole clip, and we did tell him that his whole interview is gonna be posted online in its entirety. Um, but when it's pre-recorded, then if you mess up, you can say like, hey, can I restart, you know? And we can kind of walk through it. Kind of like piggyback on mm -hmm. top of that. Like, yes, the, the reporter has the right to uh, go, think on their feet and change the questions, but more than likely if you like ask for them ahead of time, you know, mm -hmm. can you please let us know? Like, you won't be blindsided. Yes, the At general questions that reporter. we're going to be talking about just to like help prepare your client even further so that they, you know, they know what's coming their way. Mm -hmm. And then usually, like you said, in local news, it's not going to be a gotcha kind of thing. Yeah. It's, um, I work with local news a lot, and you're you're totally right. Like they are, they're on our side, and they're they're willing to work with us. Great. Well, it is a horror theme, <laughs> and I'm now going to hand over to Jane, who's going to tell us a little bit more about some of the horror stories locally here in Austin. Well, there's several, but this is one from the late 1800s. So let me tell you both the story about Austin and possibly America's first serial killer. So let's go back to December 30th of 1884. A man named Walter Spencer stumbles into his employer's home completely covered in blood from a gaping head wound. Can I stand while I tell this yeah. story? It is yeah. strange yeah. to sit and tell a story. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's the theater yeah. kid. Exactly. Turn on the lights, get a low, get the music going. Yeah. Let's get the pop. So, Do it. Glass of wine. So Mr. Spencer stumbles into his employer's home completely covered in blood from a gaping head wound. His employer wakes up, sees the state that he's in, addresses his head wounds, and says, oh my god, dude, what happened to you? Because they totally talked like that during the 1800s. I read it yes. online, and everything on the internet is true, right? Right. <laughs> so he said what happened, and Mr. Spencer said that he was laying in bed next to his girlfriend, Molly, when he heard a rattle at their front door. When he woke up to see what the commotion was, as soon as he raised up out of bed, he was met with a sharp blow to the head that rendered him unconscious. And when he woke up, Molly was nowhere to be found. Now, this being the time period it was, and Mr. Spencer having the station in life that he did, unfortunately, his employer didn't really take him seriously. He said, listen, man, I'm not getting out in the middle of the night to go look for your girlfriend. We'll find her as soon as first light hits. And the next morning, that's exactly what happened. If you were to take a map of Austin then and juxtapose it with a map of Austin now, you would see that Molly and Mr. Spencer's back porch was roughly about in the flagship Whole Foods parking lot at 5th and Lamar, so you're welcome for your next Instagram or, or Instacart order. But they did find her body 50 feet from her back porch. Witnesses said that she'd lost so much blood in the process of her murder that it looked like she was floating in a pool of her own blood. When the coroner came to collect Molly's body, he couldn't just pick her up for casketing. According to the notes he had to use that day, he had to use wood to casket her body to pick her up and hold her together. So this starts a one year, almost to the day, reign of terror by a guy that we would later call the Servant Girl Annihilator. Now we get this crazy name, Servant Girl Annihilator, actually from American author O. Henry. 
So Henry's from the Carolinas originally. He'd moved down to Austin for a little bit. And in May of 1885, when he was living down here, he wrote a letter to a friend of his in Colorado. And in this letter, he talks about how Austin was dreadfully boring, which in our defense, it was the middle of nowhere back then, but nonetheless, dreadfully boring, with the exception of the occasional antics of the servant girl annihilator to make lively the dull hours of the night. <laughs> Don't we all love true crime in the summer, right? So you can tell by the name of this monster, he mostly went after female servant workers. Altogether, eight women and one man lost their life at the hands of the servant girl annihilator. The man was a guy named Orange Washington who, blessed his heart in a very real way, was just a nice guy at the wrong place at the wrong time. He was laying in bed next to his girlfriend Gracie, and Gracie also died at the hands of the servant girl annihilator that same evening. The youngest victim of this monster was an 11-year-old girl named Mary Ramey. Her mother Rebecca was also a victim of violence that same evening, but Rebecca was able to survive her injuries and live out the rest of her natural life, which honestly, as a mother, I can't think of a worse hell to live through. So like I said, this goes on for about a year until we get to December 24th of 1885 and the servant girl annihilator changes up his MO a little bit. Instead of killing two servant women, he kills two women who are married to two very prominent businessmen here in Austin and then the killings all stop after that. Now fast forward a few years to August of 1888 and that's when Jack the Ripper starts his reign of terror in Whitechapel, London. Now there's a compelling school of thought that I ascribe to as an amateur virologist, which yes, as a woman in my 40s, I always put that on a resume, because that will set the tone for any interview you walk into, really. <laughs> <laughs> it says that the servant girl annihilator and Jack the Ripper could be the same evil son of a gun. So let's talk about the reasons that could be. First is the timeline adds up. We know that the servant girl annihilator's last canonical kill was December 24th of 1885, which in theory gives one just enough time to wrap up your affairs here in Austin, hop on a boat, go across the ocean, land in London, scooch over to Whitechapel, just in time to start killing sex workers in August of 1888. Now speaking of that, there is a similar victimology between the two cases. We know that for the most part, the servant girl annihilator went after female servant workers, and we know that Jack the Ripper and his five accepted canonical kills exclusively killed female sex workers. Now we've talked about the victimology, we've talked about the timeline, now let's address the, address the escalation of violence. And I'm gonna guess what you guys are all thinking. You're thinking, Jane, serial killers don't change their MO. Nobody's thinking that, that's why I tell ghost stories, so I'm not a psychic. But anyway, so if you were thinking that, you're right. For the most part, serial killers don't change their MO, but when we look at history, we have to use proper context, right? Given the survival landscape that we were living in back then, most of us weren't walking around strapped like we are nowadays, unless it's in some way vocation related, because you know, you're in law enforcement, you're a rancher, or something like that. But given the survival landscape we live in, most of our homes are filled with really cool daily use tools that can also be appropriated into weaponry. Probably got an ice pick in some parts of the country, an ax in other parts for a little more well-to-do, might even have a family shotgun of some sort. So when you think about crimes that happened inside somebody's home back then, where the perpetrator was from outside of the home, that perpetrator would have used whatever weapons of opportunity they could find within the building, and then coupled that with whatever we learned from our previous crimes. Now armed with that new criminal justice knowledge, let's look at our two cases again. As we know, for the most part, the servant girl annihilator went after female servant workers. And we know that Jack the Ripper, like I said, went after female sex workers. We also know that Jack the Ripper was so deft with his knife work that until he gave himself the moniker of Jack the Ripper by writing into the London newspaper, that people would refer to him as either the surgeon or the butcher because of how deft he was with his knife work. So maybe if we would have caught him in Austin, he wouldn't have been Jack the Ripper. And that's it. <laughs> wow. Good story. And um, you drive hearses for? Haunted ATX. Yeah. Okay. So we have two classic hearses and we drive people around and tell them ghost stories. It's a great adult job. <laughs> I think we're going to go on one of those. <laughs> so, so we're going to open up for some questions. So if anybody has got some questions for the panel, we, uh, we'd be delighted to take them. Before I get into marketing, I have to know, is there a history of this servant girl annihilator seeking publicity and writing to, I don't think the Chronicle was founded until like 1915 or something like that. So what would have been the local publication at that time? The, it would have been a version of the Statesman, but I can't remember what it was called exactly then. I think it was known as the Daily Statesman back then. But if I'm wrong, I just tell ghost stories on the internet for a <laughs> To make the, you know, not all serial killers, there's no connection that says all serial killers are one way. Mm -hmm. That'd be an interesting connection as well. I'm intrigued. <laughs> I want to do some research on that now. <laughs> um, what, on the spooky side, what would you say is the best way to experience Austin? Where, where, where should we go to experience this? 
You should come on one of my tours. <laughs> no, um, if you wanted to just go on your own to somewhere really cool and spooky, I always like to tell people to go to Cedars Oaks. Um, it's between the Ascension Seat and the hospital. And it's one of those places when you go there during the day, it's this beautiful park with covered walking. But then when you're there at night, it's got a completely different vibe to it. And feel free to watch the episode that we put out on YouTube to get the full history of it. So. <laughs> Brilliant. Any questions? What's YouTube? <laughs> what, what's YouTube? Yeah, is it haunted ATX as well? Uh, well, no, it's unearthly paranormal. If you want, I can give you some information for that. So, yeah. Cool. Maggie, um, what has been the most interesting development from transitioning to in front of the camera to then PR? Um, honestly, just the, I guess, timing on everything. In news, I felt like every single day I was getting in there and running around like a chicken with my head chopped off. Like every single day, I could be working on a story from 9 a.m. till 4 p.m. and then something breaking will happen and I'll just have to completely drop everything and go to that story. Um, so I feel like on the PR side of things, I actually have more time to like flesh things out um, and also be a little more creative, I guess. That's probably been the biggest transition. And a social life, that too. <laughs> <That's> nice. <laughs> Sounds like an upgrade. Yes, for sure. Now waking up at 3 a.m. on the weekends. It's great. Cool. Any other questions? Sarah, mm -hmm. uh, did you ever watch the show The Boys? Mm -hmm. um, a little bit. I've caught it kind of in the background. My partner here, he watches it occasionally. <laughs> okay. Well, I was picturing, uh, when you were talking, I was like picturing the the publicist girl in that show, she's like always yes. pulling her hair out because yes. the, the heroes are like always doing stupid, yeah. horrible things, and she's always doing crisis management, and she's like all, just like pulling gobs of her hair out. So hopefully yep. you're not you're not doing that. I uh, <laughs> no no. I think like I've I've just seen such a wide gambit of things happen. Like my first job in PR, my client was Forever Twenty One, and it was around the time when they were like getting you know terrible press every single day about their factories in like third world countries and it was just it was uh it kind of like desensitized me a little bit just of like you know when something happens it it starts to feel like a less of a bigger deal I guess and and you just kind of every time you handle something you know you get more confidence that no matter what happens you're able to to manage it and get through it and advise your clients and um, and so I think it just honestly it takes practice and uh, and being a people person just knowing how to deal with a lot of different personalities and yeah I actually had my first moment like that this week um, <laughs> oh boy <laughs> one of our clients get this girl a cocktail yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of our clients who we usually don't deal with a whole lot we mainly help them with crisis communications mm -hmm. um, I won't give too many details to because I don't want to say who they are but basically they had an article run and a TV piece run on like every single one of the outlets in their area um, and they didn't like the article but they didn't like the article because they didn't like the study that it referenced. Um, and it's hard to dispute scientific studies because it's a scientific study. Mm -hmm. Like there's no, it's the facts. So anyways, um, most of their team was very understanding and we were trying to get this uh, multiple authors to at least add an editor's note and at least have a sentence or something from this group so that our side of it essentially could be part of the narrative. Um, and most of the team was totally fine with the statement that I had written up. It's very neutral. And the main person that I needed his stamp of approval on it was like, this is way too vanilla. This is absolutely ridiculous journalism. I can't even call it journalism. This reporter should be shamed and all this stuff. And he wanted to like attack this one journalist because he hadn't even seen the 10 other articles that every single outlet had covered. Um, and so I had to go back and forth with him with 10 different drafts of me being like, I hear you and I understand your frustrations, but attacking the reporter isn't gonna get them to publish something beneficial to your group. Mm -hmm. So you need to tone yeah. it back a little bit. Um, and it took the basically his whole team being like, okay, we need to get this moving, otherwise two weeks are gonna pass and nobody's gonna care about the article anymore. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of keeping your composure. Mm -hmm. Oh, and yeah. then one of his other team members replied, and we have actually three members of our team at Mach 1 that are previous TV journalists, and one of his 
coworkers responded, well, what can you really expect from a local TV journalist these days anyway? And we were like, okay. <laughs> Such a cop out. Okay. Ah, uh, jeez. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, so I have a question. It could be for anyone on the panel. I'm just curious. Um, have you ever used, let's say, so we were talking about situations that affected you and your organization personally. Have you ever used someone else's crisis to your benefit in your role? Or how would you do that eloquently? Because obviously, like, it's, it's a window of opportunity if they're going through a crisis, but you have to handle it. Hmm. That's a good question. I mean, yeah. we did at Envoto, it was a video commerce startup. It was actually headquartered across the street, curiously enough. But um, one of our competitors, we used for our video hosting, because these were videos that played on e-commerce sites to help sell stuff, basically, right? The player helped measure conversions. And we used a distributed architecture. Um, I can't even remember what they're called, but multiple points of presence through like a you know server like Cloudflare or something. I don't remember who the provider was. And so fundamentally, if our infrastructure went down, our videos would keep playing. We had a competitor that didn't do that. Their content and other things were hosted on sort of their main servers, so on AWS servers, actually. So when a a a AWS had a massive outage and their stuff was down for days, and we really talked about how much should we go out against them and say, their stuff isn't working, our stuff is, let's talk about the difference. And my philosophy on that is always, it's okay to punch up, but don't punch down. Mm. So yeah. if like our competitor were Adobe, I would have no problem with a 100 person startup talking smack about Adobe, I really wouldn't for a large company like that. Yeah. They have a team of PR people larger than this group to figure it out mm. for them, right? But this company was one of comparable size and I did not feel right naming them specifically, although there was a lot of pressure to do so. Let's punch them, you know how people get, right? So, you know, instead we published some articles about you know, how to maintain uptime, what are, what, you know, in the infrastructure that fed our 99% uptime as well. So there's always, you can do it, and you can do it well, or you can do it in sort of a crappy way. So, yeah. It's one of those things that can backfire easy. So it's a very sensitive kind of ground to try to deal with. But I'd like to say that it's, sometimes it's not necessarily somebody else's demise or problem that a competitor may have. It can be any situation. And what I've found is that if the teams have like, thought it through, done uh, whether it is perhaps on the eventing side, disaster recovery, risk mitigation, whether it is on the PR side, doing the media training, or uh, making sure that um, you have a media pack ready, that in case there is a negative article that appears. If we've done all that preparation work, what I have found is, is that um, you get the benefit out of a bad story. And your customers or your um, very, very importantly, your employees, or in our case, our distributors, would then look back at you guys, at, at the company, and instead of finger pointing and going, "Well, look at the bad article that appeared in the in the paper," they would go, "You guys handled this exceptionally well." So, so when these things happen, everybody kind of thinks the doom and gloom, and they start talking about, you know, how how bad the company is. Then look that they've appeared in the paper. But use that to your advantage, that if you've done the preparatory work and if you get the teams on side and you, you, you do it properly, you actually come up at a, a huge era. To the extent that our one um, subsidiary company, which was a pet insurance company in the UK, got a very bad press and uh, was handled it exceptionally well to the extent that customers on Facebook started going at the journalist and the newspaper that wrote the bad article. So, and they, they hadn't done anything you know, wrong or anything like that, but it was uh, one of those stories that was um, damaging and they handled it exceptionally well. You know? so, so just bear that in mind. You can turn any bad situation into a Euro story for you and the company if you handle it well. And I'm not talking about trying to blame or finger point. Sometimes going out and admitting that you've made a mistake is the best thing. You know, the hard choices, the tough stuff that you've got to do is the best thing that you can do. Take a knock on the chin, um, own up to your mistake, and then, and then um, that, that, that actually, uh, you walk away a lot, a lot better as a business and as a community uh, you know, in, your, in your company. Um, 
Well, and yeah. the flip side of that, there's no situation that can't be made better by handling it well and for all the conversations being prepared and trained, right? There's also no situation you can't make worse if you choose to handle it badly. Yeah. When you find yourself in a hole, the first rule is to stop digging, right? Yeah. Yeah. I will say, um, thinking like outside of PR in that kind of scenario, um, I was running marketing for a startup actually locally for a little bit um, and we were delivering food from small local farms to people in the area and uh, right around the time where you know we were really working on growing our sales in Austin we found out that one of the local CSAs one of the biggest ones um, just started they stopped delivering to people um, and it kind of, they just kind of like ghosted on their customers and you know we got wind that you know there was some not great treatment happening you know with their staff and so we didn't uh, I mean I will never advise a client ever to negatively comment on another competitor um, so we didn't go that route um, we instead adjusted our digital marketing budget um, and the way that we targeted customers and so we for the next like two weeks heavily targeted people who were buying from this uh, local CSA to capture those customers because it was an opportunity. You know, they weren't getting their deliveries. Hello, here's another option for you where you can get even more food from other you know CSAs that we deliver directly to your door. So, um, yeah, it was just kind of I think you know to your point, it's like you just continue to think creatively you know you're always trying to find the opportunity that's going to give you growth um and it doesn't always have to be just like a, anything public or what people know it's you know use your use all your channels strategically um and really think of it that way a tool that we kind of use for this at the capitol is um especially because obviously the legislative session is months long and especially if you're in a certain industry, you're gonna be talking or competing essentially against other people in the same industry but with opposing views the entire session. So you don't wanna publicly bash these other people. But a lot of the times if you hire an independent PR firm, um, what they can do on your behalf then is run like shadow campaigns, which is then just basically pitching something that would benefit your side of things without ever mentioning your company name but finding a story that would paint your industry your side of things in a positive light just pitching a good story to a local reporter getting coverage on that so it's not really directly attacking that other company but it's working to your benefit yeah. um, also forming if you have if like playing the long game <laughs> if you're able to form like a shadow organization or a shadow like nonprofit basically that's fighting for things that you would like to come more strongly down on but you don't want your company's name attached to it that's an, that one requires a couple months time so great okay so we're going to finish off with one key takeaway from each of you and uh, uh, one lesson or, or uh, one insight that you'd like to impart to everybody uh, to prepare for those disasters like words of wisdom we'll start with Russ oh my Oh my, um, I pass. Oh, no, come back to me. Okay. I'm, I'm trying right. to think for a moment. Okay. Um, I would say there's no such thing as being over prepared. Yeah. Okay. I would say come take a ghost tour. <laughs> <laughs> it could always be worse. <laughs> um, I would say very similarly, like plan A, plan B, plan C, like just really think of every single thing that could um, happen because I always go in with a mindset of like what can happen will happen and as long as you're prepared as long as you know you just think ahead in most cases you'll you'll come out okay I would say that um, intuitively as human beings when things are going well we ease up and when things are going bad then we're all on it we're like running all miles mm -hmm is that the best thing that I've done with teams is to, when things are going great, revenue's rolling in, sales are on the app, everyone's in a great mood, and everyone's earning lots of cash. I get them into a room on a regular basis and go, what if? Because it's in the good times that you miss the mistakes, and it's in the bad times when the mistakes surface. And then you're, you're scrambling, and you don't, know what, you don't make the right decisions. 
and that's the that's the best times to actually ask the what if questions and do the preparation. Mm -hmm. I love that. That is a good yeah. lesson. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and, and so preparation is pretty much the theme through all of these. I'm going to go a slightly different direction, only because 20 years in tech marketing, shipped booths all over the country, all over the world, never had one not show up because the event logistics people know what they're doing and are, they're really good at it. So no matter no matter how much you prepare eventually something will happen yeah. that you're not prepared yeah. for. So smile, laugh, have your teams back, have each other's back, and remember that you will laugh about it, it may be 10 years later, <laughs> but you will laugh about it at some point. Well, that's a great segue just to say a very big congratulations to Marissa. She has done an absolutely <laughs> amazing <laughs> Thank you to all the AMA volunteers and VPs for helping us out. Um, we're now going to enjoy some drinks and something nice to eat and to network, to learn from each other, and look forward to seeing you guys at the next event. Thank you. Oh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say this. Thank you very much to our speakers for your time and your yeah. amazing talks. I appreciate it. It's done. Uh, it's funny that you might have to be over at Coopers, but back in the day, she also came from. Yeah, it was Lisa. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Thank you for